Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public. Hi, I'm Bob Dambach. And I'm Barb Gravel. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the people and places that contribute to the arts, culture, and history in our region. On this edition, we'll meet another finalist in the search for a new conductor, tour an historic flour mill in Minnesota, and listen to three generations of the Northern Minnesota family play some authentic bluegrass music. John Offit has worked for years developing his glass blowing skills to capture the shapes, the colors, and the light of the plains. His inspiration comes from gazing across the prairie. His interpretation is stunning works of art in the form of blown glass. I get up fairly early in the morning and come out to the shop and light the studio on fire. It takes about an hour and a half for things to warm up. And during that time, I empty the ovens of the work I made the day before, pick out the colors. This is one of my favorite sounds. The glass rods have their own. I kind of pre-visualize what I'm gonna make for the day, do all the make ready so that when my assistant shows up, we're ready to go. Then we'll start whatever the project is for the day. Go ahead, Dave, if it's ready. I started out in Fargo Public Schools, down at the Creative Arts Studio. Did a lot of clay down there. That little blob of glass is close to 2,000 degrees right now. That's where I found my love for the vessel form. The hotter the glass gets, the softer it becomes. When I transferred to Morehead State, they had glass as an elective. When I, I tried it, the process is so much more immediate. The feedback loop is so fast that it was just much more suited to my personality. I'm gonna use the friction of the table, the torque on that pipe, to twist that color up a little bit. So I've worked up the primary color. The learning curve on blowing glass is very, very frustrating. Dave's heating up one of the, the accent colors. There's a lot of smashing that happens at the beginning. A lot of things fall off the stick and get stuck to the door. And there's very little success for the first couple of years of doing this. Most of the work that I do is decorative. And I'll call it art with a small a versus art with a big A. It's not about content and message and emotion. It's about being well-crafted and functional we use a lot of strange tools, leather punches and cordless drills. It, it depends on what you want to see. It's, it's relating to the material. I have a lot of visual interest going on in that, that little button. So some of it can be engineering. Um, usually it's, it's more reverse engineered. I want to see this piece how, what are the steps that it's gonna take me to get to here. We're gonna start up now. Dave will take the pipe and pick up some white powder and heat. When you start something new, there's a lot more communication as to what to do and when to do it. Dave and I are the only skilled hands for a couple hundred miles. So there's the two of us. If there were five of us, the work would probably be larger and more complex. I'm really enamored with the landscapes. Um, they continue to get more complex um, and bigger in scale. They're so representational and they have some interest in the land and there's some depth to the sky. That orange color is because it is so hot. Start to pick up that blue. Technically, they're very challenging, so they're fun for me to do for that reason. So there I've created the sky and they do have an, an emotive quality. People can look at them and recognize them 
and say, oh yes, this is a July day or this is a, a spring morning. So there is some, some art in the more recent work. The bread and butter of the, the craft work that allows me to keep my skills up and keep my studio running so that when I do want to turn my attention to sculpture or something more emotive, I have those skills, I have the facility to do that. So on that scale, I've created all of the visual elements that are going to be in this piece. Being able to think creatively. So now I'll put another layer of clear glass over that. Being able to make an aesthetic judgment. I drip a little bit of that off of there. Is that beautiful or is it not? Is that good or is it not? Is that quality? Do you want to fill your life with quality things? So it's like a little landscape already. Each step um, over the last two months, I've really been working on the land. Start by moving it around with the table. I think I have it down where I want it now and I can accomplish what I want to see. Finish shaping with just a small section of folded newspaper. So I'm going to turn my attention to variations in the sky, variations in clouds. He's going to go ahead, add a little pressure here, and the sky is going to get bigger. Four times a year I'll make something that I like so much that I'll sign my last name to it. Most of my work is just signed John, and there's a few of my pieces that go out that are signed John Offit on the bottom. Point it down and let it stretch a little bit, a little bit of centrifugal force pull that out a little bit longer. Would I like to be doing it in 10 years? I hope to be doing it in 10 years. I'm good. I hope to take on another apprentice. Little puff. Have more help so that I can accomplish what I want to see. Stop. This is what makes life worth living. Don't try and make a living at it. It's a crazy, crazy way to it it's, shouldn't be a profession. It should be something you love to do. Pickwick Mills, Minnesota is home to an historic flour mill. The working mill captures the fascination of people from all over North America and the world with its authentic style and rich history. We're on the sixth floor of the Pickwick Mill, which is a restored flour grinding mill. This is the largest one in the state of Minnesota that has been restored, and it was also one of the first commercial businesses in the state of Minnesota. They actually got the mill running in 58, and they had five employees, and their annual payroll was $3,000 a year for the five. They used to grind flour for the Union Army, and they ground 100 barrels a day, 24 hours a day. It was constructed with local timber and local stone. It was put together with no nails. A lot of the big beams are all notched and put together with wooden pegs. And down on the fourth floor and fifth floor, there's an iron tie bar that runs through from one side of the building to the other, and that tie bar's got a turnbuckle in the middle to tighten it up, and that's what held the building together when they were building it. Down on the third floor, there's a scale and a hopper, and they unloaded the grain into that hopper, and it was weighed. Once they weighed it, they opened the door in the bottom of that hopper, Everything went to the bottom floor here, and there's bucket conveyors that carried everything all the way up to the top floor, and then it goes across the wooden auger over here, and then it starts its journey back down. It depended on which way they wanted to go with it, and it had to make the trip back and forth more than once. When they used grinding stones, it actually had to make the trip about four times. When they used a roller mill, it just had to come up and go down to whichever mill they wanted, and then it got sifted out, and then they had their flour. Back during the war years, a lot of that equipment out of some of these mills got scrapped out from metal for the war. 
We were fortunate this one did not get that depth, mainly because they were still grinding livestock feed here. The equipment was here. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have any place to start because you can't get it. This building was in really bad shape. They were going to tear it down, but some of the local families go way back to when this building was built. And so they had a desire to save it. That's why they formed Pickwick Mill Incorporated. And we've worked on it since 1980, getting it restored. We've got it to the point now that when we have groups and bus tours, we do run all the machinery on all six floors with the water wheel. The water wheel itself, um, we built that in 96. That is four feet wide, is 20 feet high. When it's loaded and working heavy, each one of those steps will hold 240 pounds of water. They had dragged the old wheel out about the turn of the century, and they put a water turbine out there because that wouldn't freeze up as bad in the wintertime as a wheel. But when we started to restore they took the water turbine out because people don't want to see that. They want to see a wheel going around. So we got the plans from the National Organization of Mills on how to build a water wheel, and we built it right back here. And that's where we get all the leverage to run all the machinery on all six floors. We just run everything for display purposes. We do not grind. If we did, every mouse in the country would probably know about it. <laughs> We get a lot of school kids in here, and we do get people in here from all over the world. But if you speak slowly and use your hands, we usually get by pretty good. A little over a month ago, we had an international group here from six different countries. That's all they do is go around and tour the mills. The best part was when they sent us a thank you note, they sent it in six different languages. <laughs> It's done with volunteers and donations. We've got 240 members. I try to keep volunteers lined up because we're open six days a week here during the summer. We do have several local people that do volunteer to help us out. The names on all the steps and risers are people that have donated $100 towards the mill. It's just a way of saying thanks for doing it. Conductor Daryl Oney has conducted numerous orchestras encompassing a wide range of repertoire and concert formats throughout the United States. His credits go beyond the podium. He is also an arranger and composer, having written over 30 arrangements for orchestras and smaller ensembles. Recently, Oni brought his talents to the FM area as a finalist in the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony Orchestra Conductor Search. <coughs> get the frog, get the frog! Da, 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 yeah! The first time I ever heard uh, orchestral symphonic music was when I was in college. Good, good, that's it, yeah! And it was a recording of a Mahler symphony. I mean, the range of emotion was already great, but on top of it, the range of color was even more outstanding. It was as if I was living in a world of black and white and a world of color just opened up to me. Bravo! I was born in Chicago. I was a math major, and two years into my major is when I uh, decided I wanted to learn something more about music. And they said, well, we're testing for, for uh, students to place them in levels of theory, so come for the test uh, tomorrow. So I came and I took the test, and it uh, turned out that I got the highest score of anybody uh, who took the test. Love theory so much that I changed my major from math to um, theory composition. From there, there on, uh, as all music majors have to do, they all have to take a beginning conducting class. I took the class and when I was finished, I still remember the instructor coming up to me and said, well, what would you think about going into conducting? 
You know, you have a nice fluid technique, good ears, you can hear things, and uh, I think you kind of planted a seed. Hey, retake these. Da, da. Da, da, da. Good. And go, go. Moto, moto. With younger people, the more uh, variety of music they get to hear, I think that's better because they're still forming their opinions of uh, you know, what is the music that they like. One, and one, and two, and one! Yeah, almost, almost. You just have to get off there and get as quick as you can, Violas. I know you, you got to play that and get ready and find the note. One more time, one more time. And one, and two, and one, and two, and bam! Ah, bravo, bravo. That's what we need. That's exactly what we need. I think that uh, most conductors, you know, if you ask them when they first start out uh, what they want to do with their conducting career, they'd always probably say something along the lines of, well, I'd love to be the conductor of the New York Philharmonic. And uh, I think that's probably true at the very beginning, but as you conduct and you get various opportunities, then you start to find the area that you're the most comfortable in and the area that you think you could make the most impact in. Mine was more uh, working with the, the smaller orchestras. For me, what interests me about an orchestra, besides the, the music, and of course it's wonderful, the music is wonderful, but it's the people that you're working with. If you're working with a board of directors and a staff and within a community that has a certain kind of connection with the orchestra, it makes all the difference. With the uh, smaller orchestras, you get that kind of uh, vibe where the, the board of directors, when you talk to the people that are on there, they're on it because they love music. Bella is going to be coming out and she's going to be doing the uh, Brook uh, Violin Concerto No. 1 in G minor. And the best thing I can say about it is that it's one of the most popular of the violin concertos. Um, very contemplative uh, uh, first movement with high energy in the middle of it. The second movement is just beautiful. It's just beautiful. And in fact, uh, Bella is commenting that it's her favorite second movement among uh, violin concertos because it's just so tuneful. As a conductor, our job is that when we stand up in front of the orchestra for the first rehearsal, that you have to have unchallengeable knowledge about the piece. Hopefully by the time I've gone through all this and I have this knowledge in my head, then I'm ready for that first rehearsal to, to bring that uh, picture that I have in my mind now of this piece uh, into you know, sonic reality. Obviously we want to present things that are popular and things that people will want to buy tickets for. We want to do performances that we as, a, as an organization feel good about and proud about, so we don't want to bite off more than we can chew, you know, and we want to do things that will show us in the best light. Part of uh, my thinking in, in programming is, is for the orchestra too, it's for the future, it's to make the orchestra better. So you have to pick repertoire that makes us better, because then that's going to make it to the point down the road where, okay, now those pieces that we said is off limits, we can do now. The Fargo-Moorhead Symphony is searching for its next music director. This season, our Masterworks concerts will each be led by one of the five finalists. The decision of who will be the next artistic leader will involve valuable input from the orchestra musicians, audience members, symphony supporters, students, and members of the community, including you. The countdown begins. Who will be the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony's next conductor? The Slugrass Family Band hails from the most northern reaches of Minnesota. The eight family members span over three generations and enjoy putting their own twist on some traditional bluegrass favorites. Pines and 
the hills of Caroline, and a blue-eyed girl is waiting there for me. I'll be going back someday, from her I'll never stray, in a cabin in the hills of Caroline. For that long lost trip back to the hills of Caroline. For to see that blue eyed girl, I'm sweetest in the world, in a cabin in the hills of Caroline. Well, in 2009, we, um, we bought a bus from the Salvation Army, an uh, early 1980s bus, and it was in pretty bad shape, and we, um, we just got the brakes fixed on it and made sure the exhaust couldn't come inside, and we, put, um, we made it into a motorhome, and then we drove to North Carolina. And uh, to me, that was probably the best thing we'd done as a band. It was kind of a family trip. It was, everybody, we just jumped in the bus, we drove, we didn't have any plans, and that was just a lot of fun. That was just... For us, it's every time we do something together, it's like, well, that's another memory. i 
Big thing picking out those granny What you know about Ohio Hurry up boys and don't fool the ground Grab your partner and truck on down If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make an interesting segment, please contact us at prairiemosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Dambach. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>